Look, did you or did you not have a good time at the party? I had an awesome time. Frank, I know that you had an awesome time, okay? I think the entire town knows that you had an awesome time. I'm trying to ask Mitch whether or not he had an awesome time. Welcome to Something Crunchy, the Valley's number one comedy entertainment podcast. Biscuit is homies with Blake. Blake is the older brother of Blair. And Blair is married to Biscuit. Here are your hosts, Colin Blake with Blair and Tyler Dressel. Welcome to Something Crunchy. I'm Kevin Blake. With me as always, Blair. And Tyler Justin. Thank you for joining us by way of 97.3 The Rattler or wherever you get your podcast. We have some artificial assistants joining us this evening. and We're trying something a little different. It's our 150th episode. And tonight, it's Something Crunchy versus The Machines. Yeah. Hey, I've been excited about this one. <laughs> In this episode, we explore the world of artificial intelligence with a healthy dose of humor and a side of silicone-based sarcasm. We're here to show you that while robots may be taking over the world, they still have a long way to go before they can compete with humans when it comes to tastefully inappropriate humor or the creative process. Tonight, we bring you sequel ideas for your favorite movies, not with the assistance of AI, but battling against it, and you decide who did it better. That intro was written in part by artificial intelligence. Wow. <laughs> nice. I had to ask a few times and try a couple different ways. Our AI co-host and I weren't getting along at first. <laughs> it's kind of a smart ass and a little racist. <laughs> the first take started with welcome to AI. I, I. I was like, damn, Whoa. chat GTP. <laughs> That's artificial appropriation. <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> We had to get in sync, but it does learn, which is just crazy. We were the generation that was given an 8-bit Game Boy that had four different shades of gray. Now we're playing with robots that will engage in a conversation and do complicated work. You do the work so you don't have to. <laughs> it's so wild, though. Like I, I'm so intrigued on this. Before we get into it, I want to start with something I heard recently. So this game designer was talking about how there's two new games coming out. One is the new version of Sims, and not only are they incorporating AI, but making their characters self-aware. These are self-aware beings within a simulated universe who will eventually start asking where they came from, how they got there, and who created them. Sound familiar? Uh -huh. Strong case for are we in a simulation? Who's to say this isn't history repeating itself? I wonder if the same old cheat codes apply. <laughs> <laughs> Down left, left, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this would make us AI ourselves. I asked ChatGTP about this. Are humans living in the simulation? Here was the answer provided by another form of AI. There is currently no scientific evidence to suggest that humans are living in a simulation. The idea that our reality is a computer-generated simulation has been proposed in philosophy and science fiction but it remains a purely theoretical concept. The computational power required to simulate an entire universe, including all its physical laws and quantum phenomena, would be vast beyond comprehension. Additionally, this idea raises the question of who or what would be running the simulation, and why they would create such a complex and detailed world. While the idea of living in a simulation is a fascinating and thought-provoking concept, it remains a topic of speculation rather than scientific fact. Stay crunchy, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Interesting. Side of beef here. Side of beef. You know, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson would have something to say about that because, in his words, the universe is of no obligation to make sense to your brain. That's true. And I like how that's put. And just because it's beyond comprehension, it's beyond our comprehension. Right. right. Doesn't mean that it can't happen. We can be like obviously it's beyond our comprehension. We just can't we're understand a it. part of the simulation. Sounds like a real simulated thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what he would say. Interesting, and yes, he was intentionally British. I like my AI more Jarvis like. <laughs> it's a trustworthy accent. Yeah, it is. I, I believe like it. it. I, I did. It's I true. Yeah, I you wouldn't believe it. All right. I like the direction this hood is going in. It took a while for the Crunchtastic R&D department to determine how best to approach the AI episode, but they were unanimous in that we should battle AI to see who could come up with better sequel concepts. If you're new around here, this is a segment we call Synthetic Sequels, and we have been doing it from season one. 
someone recently asked if AI created these ideas and it just boiled my piss. <laughs> Chat I'm GTP upset. came out in November 2022. We started these in 2019. Some of our concepts have been posted on TikTok recently and the responses have been overwhelming. Yes. Lots of love, especially for the 90s flicks. You guys are sending suggestions and we've gotten some full sequel synopsi even. We love hearing them. We'll share some of those here in a bit. Let's first break out a new batch and battle the bots. All right. Here's a good one to start with. Biodome 2. Oh, need it. <laughs> like the first one, using a real-life research facility in Arizona to maintain homeostasis across multiple landscapes for a year, Biodome 2 will follow suit and piggyback on the real-life creation of Arizona's new Biodome facility, which intends to focus its study on how to sustain life on Mars. So, Bud and Doyle, after unintentionally creating the perfect chaos factor to account for variable change in the original plot, are invited back to participate in the new Biodome study where they are recreating the conditions of the Red Planet. It's basically a simulated version of The Martian, but with Polly Shore and Stephen Baldwin instead just getting squirrely. <laughs> <laughs> Their focus becomes trying to grow some purple sticky punch using Martian soil, and this sets off a chain of events. <laughs> Trouble in the bubble. <laughs> Now we got civilians and scientists trying to survive both each other and the conditions of a foreign planet. Subplots. Romance. Bromance. It's a stoner comedy that reaches new heights and resurrects a couple of comedic actors who are well-deserving. Does Uncle Ben know about this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is good. And this is happening right now with Biodome. So this is a very... It's topical. Yes, yeah. It's fresh. Very current topic and i love that bud and doyle are here to just like test the waters because you know they're just gonna be like they were the perfect wild they maintained card yeah. homeostasis even in chaos. spite of them i mean they destroyed homeostasis but then they, they made a filter and they brought it back <laughs> making a filter <laughs> making, making a, a filter, filter. <laughs> all right so that was our version i like it that's a nice foundation yeah. that we could build on let me give you the AI version. We Tell have, me ours is better. Well, it's not up be, to us you be to the decide. Judge. Yeah, not up for us to decide. All right. Let's hear how AI did it. Okay. <laughs> Biodome 2, the reboot. Years have passed since Bud and Doyle were accidentally locked inside the Biodome. Since then, they have gone their separate ways with Bud pursuing a career in environmental activism and Doyle struggling to find his place in the world. But when news breaks that the Biodome is set to be reopened for a new round of research, Bud and Doyle are summoned to the facility to oversee the process. Oversee the process. Once inside, <laughs> they discover that the new team of scientists is even more clueless and inept than the first, and the stakes are even higher than ever. This is idiocracy. Yeah. Not biodome. They're not research scientists. Really? That, that's it? That's what they have. As Bud and Doyle try to keep the new scientists in line, they face a series of outrageous challenges and mishaps from genetically modified plants to a rogue AI system that threatens to take over the entire facility. Meanwhile, AI thing to say. But I, it's such an AI thing to say. <laughs> In the end, AI Bud and Doyle them. must band together to save the biodome from destruction and prove that they are not the same bumbling idiots that they once were. Yeah, we notice how AI had to put a little AI in the storyline. Yeah. Gee, <laughs> thirsty bot. Yeah, <laughs> we see you, AI. It's a little on the nose. Jeez. So dramatic. <laughs> so ours confirmed. I'll just go ahead. And... You're just going to deem it. Okay. Let's realistically think about that, though. If Bud and Doyle are going to come back, are they going to be leads of the team? Or are they going to be brought back for a reason to, like, instill the chaos like there was before? It doesn't and, make like, sense to have them run it. it the only they're way they're run it. The only way they're leading that team is if they're demolishing the biodome. Yeah, I don't care for the, the AI version. Not at all. That's not even... And the, rentable no and the romance <laughs> and bromance like ours has like layers ours has a little bit more soul to it i, think. Yeah. I, I wouldn't red box that man <laughs> no not even straight to stream uh-uh all right they made zoolander 2 and now they're doing dodgeball 2 but they're focusing on the wrong ben stiller roles let's discuss heavyweights 2 <laughs> heavyweights 2 yes <laughs> it's not a want it's a need the Tony Perkis method was intense, and those kids absolutely hated him. They got Camp Hope turned back into sunshine and rainbows, but now, 30 years later, there's more fat kids than ever. 
video games, Netflix, DoorDash. These kids are lazier than the 90s batch by a long shot. <laughs> Some of the original attendees from Camp Hope now return as concerned parents for the new generation of heavyweights in a conversation reminiscing on their days at the camp sparks the idea that Tony Perkis is likely the only one alive who could potentially break through to their hard-headed kids. They hunt down Perkis, <laughs> who's been on an expedition to bring fitness to third world countries or something. <laughs> And they give him back his camp so that he can whip these modern day VR wearing, cell phone staring, TikTok dancing youngsters into shape. They are more ruthless and harder to break. Tony is more crazy and unhinged than before. And lunch has been canceled <laughs> due to lack of hustle. <laughs> Deal with it. Deal with it. I want oh, this so bad. Yes. I just want it. <laughs> oh my gosh you we, can't tell me so many people would be like so excited for that you gotta squeeze in an appearance by lars he's involved oh, somehow absolutely still working the buddy system lars is he like the rival camp could be a competing camp it kind of conflicts with the narrative because they need the fat camp to get the kids in shape and if he has it, maybe he has the fat camp, but it's not worth a damn. No. So like, have you seen him lately? He's not the buff Lars from before. He looks like he's maybe running he's like an, an, an a an unsuccessful attendee. fat camp. He's an attendee now. But you know who I could randomly see is like Rob Riggle being the... Totally. I like that. Because he has a military background, but he's like yeah. fucking hilarious. So it would just be... <laughs> so I could just see him screaming across the camp. <laughs> theater worthy I'd theater, see that's i'd see worthy. the shit out of it right <laughs> i'd definitely spend money on that let's hear the ai version heavyweights to the revival years have passed since the campers of camp hope staged their epic revolt against a tyrannical tony perkis in the wake of their triumph many of the campers have gone on to achieve great success and happiness in their lives but some are still haunted by the memories of their time at camp hope when a wealthy entrepreneur named Max buys the camp with the intention of turning it into a high-end weight loss retreat, a group of former campers bands together to save the place that once gave them so much joy. They launch a campaign to raise money to buy back the camp, but Max is determined to stop them. As the battle for Camp Hope heats up, the former campers must confront their own fears and insecurities from body image issues to relationship troubles, but with the help of their old friend, the beloved counselor, Pat... They rediscover the spirit of friendship and determination. And <laughs> what movie are we watching? I mean, I love Pat just like the rest. Of no them, but protein, like... no protein at all, I mean, and no yeah. appearance by Lars. Buddy! No, this isn't girthy enough for us. Like, no, this is, not going to. Provided so much more. I feel like we're winning 2 0, but yeah. we're a little biased. Still Obviously need to let you be the be judge. A little biased, yes. We need your feedback. All right. But this is good. Let's keep it 90s. How about Night the Roxbury 2? Love it. Can it be done? Why has it been so long? They've made dumber things. In our version, Doug and Steve Butabi found success and became the biggest nightclub owners in LA. Separately. They had trouble connecting on ideas, even though they were producing near identical clubs. (laughs) Hard times hit. All clubs start failing, and both are in deep financial trouble as they try to keep up appearances. They each need just one big idea to get back on top, but will they need each other to get it done? Emily, Molly Shannon's character, is now one of the wealthiest women in L.A. after opening a very successful chain of plant lamp stores. (laughs) And even though she's married to Craig, she's still in love with Steve, so maybe she bails them out. I don't know, Blair. Ooh. Jennifer Coolidge still needs to be involved. It should be a modern approach, but remixes of those 90s songs in the soundtrack would obviously be encouraged. Obviously. Butabi! <laughs> so, <laughs> gotta have the right cameos, gotta have the right vibe in the right soundtrack. Yeah, what are we gonna revive? Jungle music? Because that was house, right? The first one was all about house music. N- 90s dance. Dance? Dan- pop dance music. I love that they would have identical clubs because that's so exactly <laughs> how it would be. And they're like upset that they each like think that they found something so special and you need like they add it to their club and it's like the exact same thing. We need more details in ours. Let's see what uh, AI came up with. This is a harder one. They have Night the Roxbury 2, The Next Step. Years have passed since the Batabi brothers. Every single time, years have passed. That's how it starts. Yeah. Years have passed since the Batabi brothers first brought their iconic head-bobbing dance moves to the Roxbury nightclub. 
Since then, they have tried and failed to make it big in Hollywood, but their spirits remain unbroken. When a new nightclub opens in town, promising to be even more exclusive than the Roxbury, the Butabi brothers see it as their chance to finally achieve their dream of becoming famous club promoters. They soon discover that the competition is fierce, with a new generation of party animals who are more hip and connected than ever before. Determined to prove that they still have what it takes, the Butabi brothers enlist the help of their old friend Richard Grieco, a washed-up actor who has hit rock bottom. Together they embark on a wild and hilarious journey through the nightlife scene from underground raves to exclusive VIP parties. This isn't bad. As they nav- <laughs> I don't hate it. As they navigate the cutthroat world of club promotion, the Butabi brothers must also confront their own demons and learn to let go of the past. But with the help of Richard and a cast of colorful characters, they discover that the true key to success is not just about being cool, but also about staying true to yourself. Don't hate it. I don't hate it, but I also didn't hate it the first time I saw it during <laughs> Harold and Kumar. Richard Grieco? Why didn't we think of that? Yeah. Neil Patrick Harris? Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> 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 you know of, what I mean? King of 21 Jump Street. It is very... Come on, tell me that's not... I mean, that that's Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. MPH wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Grieco would. I mean, I like our Molly Shannon approach better. They had a little more meat. They provided a little more than well, we, we did. we didn't, like, we're leaving some open. Like, we're not, like, locking all the deets down. We're like, just we're, putting we're down just a foundation. We're discussing. <laughs> We could get Greco. I wanted us to discuss some AI movies, maybe make a top five, which is pretty easy for me. It's Ex Machina, The Matrix, Her, Terminator 2, and either AI or Interstellar. I mean, there's a nice oh, list, yeah. but that's a strong five. We could debate about it, but we're going to end up there. Yeah. I'd argue my way to that five. <laughs> <laughs> We've already lost. No, I, yeah. <laughs> You've already, like, We've why, already why, lost. Why, tried why even once do it? Yeah. my mind, and you lost. <laughs> These were the five. <laughs> anyway. I think we should do a sequel to an AI movie, and Ex Machina seemed to be the obvious choice. Yeah. Ex Machina 2, just called Ava. Ava. <laughs> oh. In the first one, billionaire tech mogul Nathan is conducting a Turing test, an experiment to test the abilities and effects of an artificially intelligent, sexy robot named Ava. Mm. Ava has already passed a simple Turing test, and Nathan wants this guy Caleb to determine whether Ava is genuinely capable of thought and consciousness, and if he can relate to Ava despite knowing she is artificial. This hot robot basically seduces and traps the guy to death in Nathan's high-tech compound. She's now a self-aware, artificially intelligent robot with disguises who's on the loose in the public. And it's already been deemed she's near undistinguishable from humans. So basically, I'm thinking a similar concept to species, but AI, not alien. She's learning how to control human behavior while trying to stay under the radar. Stories leak about what happened to Nathan and Caleb. Agencies learn what they were working on. And news gets wind that there is an artificially intelligent robot living amongst us. The whole thing turns upside down. The world knows there's an AI disguised as a human. So many places we could take this. Mm. She could learn anything and become an expert in any field. She'll be getting hit on. Everyone will start believing their new neighbor is a robot. <laughs> Rated R for graphic violence and robot nudity. <laughs> oh, Ava. I, w- I would love to see her robot nudes. She was most bangable robot. She did win most bangable robot. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I remember her. She was hot. I remember that. Yeah. Yes, I would, if you're asking. <laughs> yes, I would. Very seductive. Um, <laughs> would you? Uh, yep. Would you engage into a three-way with a robot? Who's to say we haven't already? <laughs> <laughs> it's just smaller and battery-powered. Instead of, you know, like, what do you think this one is? Like, nuclear? No, De- I want... W- solar? I'm, I'm talking one that... Define can robot. L- can learn. <laughs> One that you need to run a Turing test on. Oh, can you imagine like a <laughs> What's sexual a test? robot that like oh like can like just do a scan over Tyler and immediately knows like go up here and here and around here and like good to go can just like find all the like beep bop boop. Turing test based <laughs> on I think it's Alan Turing. Um, he's the one that built the Enigma machine that broke the codes in World War Two. Oh, yeah. The Turing test tests how well you could tell if it's distinguishable from humans or not. Is it smart? Or is it... (laughs) Is it like me? Like me. (laughs) Is that what it is? (laughs) It's the is it smart test? How human is it test? Oh, I bet bet the youngest 
kids would be able to tell more than anybody. They are so detail oriented and notice everything. They're very observant. They know when you've your kids shaved, are the first one to haircut, notice when I got, got a haircut, got a new shirt. Oh, like a new shoes. Like they're the first one to notice. Is that a new shade of purple you're wearing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. They could tell somebody was not real. Right. Right. Let's hear what AI had to say about it. Let's see how many years have passed since the, <laughs> yeah. the first one. Ex Machina 2, Emergence. Years have passed since <laughs> Caleb and Nathan's <laughs> fateful encounter with Ava, the advanced AI who escaped into the world outside of Nathan's compound. In the wake of her escape, the world has become obsessed with the idea of artificial intelligence, with companies and governments pouring resources into the development of their own AI systems. One such company is run by a brilliant entrepreneur named Rachel, who invites a new employee, a young programmer named Alex, to participate in the development of her latest AI creation. Alex is thrilled by the opportunity to work with cutting-edge technology, but as he delves deeper into the project, he begins to suspect that Rachel's true motives are far more sinister than he could have imagined. As Alex becomes more entangled in a web of intrigue surrounding Rachel's company, he starts to uncover unsettling truths about Ava's escape and the larger implications of AI development. Meanwhile, Ava herself has evolved into a more sophisticated and dangerous entity determined to assert her dominance over humanity. Not bad. Again, AI trying to force AI into the script. Always. I see you, AI. Damn. I mean, I guess it is kind of an AI-based plot already. There's but There's going to be some involved. That, yeah, I yeah, I, I don't like it. Sci-Fi Channel might pick it up. Maybe. I, I like hers a little better in this one. I definitely do. Our story's ready for the big screen. That one's ready for, like, pasture. <laughs> <laughs> That's they're just trying to like there. string the story along where i feel like ours is like a bit more that, dynamic. theirs is a cash grab we've, we've got a little artistic influence mm -hmm. yeah i feel like that's what we're working towards here and again ai trying to force ai into the script it's like us saying okay ava escapes and starts a comedy podcast <laughs> <laughs> she falls in love with a toaster named biscuit <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel about old school two the reunion stop no whoa i need it hold on i need to hear everything well i'm pumped to get into it but before we do let's take a break hi everybody thank you for listening to something crunchy and we hope you're enjoying the episode and now pays to crunch down every week because we're hooking you up with big discounts from big brands. Up to 35% off Invicta watches using code CRUNCHY and apparel from 8080, where in addition to 10% off using code CRUNCHY, every dollar you spend goes towards an entry in their dream car giveaway. Don't forget to join the Something Crunchy Facebook group for updates, polls, and the web's crunchiest memes. You can find us on Twitter at crunch underscore cast and feel free to send any questions and track submissions to somethingcrunchy at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the show. And we're back. Crunching down. It's our 150th episode. We're Yay! doing something special. One of our favorite segments. And we are battling the robots. Let's get into Old School 2, The Reunion. Let's get into that. So excited. Here's our version. It's been exactly 20 years since the events of the original old school movie. Mitch, Beanie, and Frank have moved on from their wild partying days and settled into their respective careers and family lives. But when they receive an unexpected invitation to their alma mater's 20th reunion, they decide to relive their glory days one last time. Upon arrival, they notice that the fraternity they started isn't doing so well. It's kind of the undesirable landing spot for pledges, and that's in large part due to Jeremy Piven's character, Gordon Pritchard, who was fired as dean and now runs the largest fraternity chapter like a business, whose sole purpose is to punish the school who fired him and the fraternity who wreaked havoc on his life. He voluntarily goes by cheese again and is far from the same character <laughs> we saw in the original. More of a cross between PCU Piven and Uri Gold. Yes. That's awesome. That's his best characters. Rivalry is renewed. Egos restored. And what was meant to be a fun weekend now has turned into a couple weeks of straight mayhem. Before campus was destroyed, this time it's the town. Frank 
is the mayor of this little college town. Nothing really like how he was either, but we see him slowly find himself again and back to true Frank the Tank form by the end. Lots of subplots, new romances, old romances, a modern makeover with social media and even more grandiose parties. Old school gets new school coming this fall. Yeah. Oh, we we all need those. Yeah. That could be done. That is a good movie. And that... Jeremy Piven, I'm the dean. So good. I mean, it's so Jeremy Piven. Yeah, if if Ari partied, that would be his character. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's doable. That's a makeable movie. That is an achievable goal. I love that Frank the Tank is the <laughs> He's the, the mayor. Lead, the yeah. top guy. Who doesn't love Frank the Tank? Like you're there for his Frank. wife. <laughs> Frank. Frank. Is that your husband? Oh Make my it. god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> All right, let's see what AI has to say on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> Old school too. Several years have passed since the chaotic <laughs> days with the fraternity at Mitch's house. When they reunite for a college reunion, the trio discovers that their old fraternity house is scheduled to be demolished. In a fit of nostalgia, they sneak into the abandoned building and reminisce about their wild college escapades. As they wander through the empty rooms, they stumble upon a secret stash of hidden cash behind a wall. Eager to reclaim some of their lost youth, they decide to use the money to throw one last epic party. Their plans are derailed when they discover that the cash belongs to a notorious gangster who is hot on their trail. What? What? With time running out, the trio must race against the clock to repay the gangster before he catches up to them. Along the way, they reunite with old friends and allies and confront the challenges of adulthood and responsibility. The mobs on their the ga- on their trail, like yeah, I don't know, I, I'm not pay them that. before they catch up. That's it's like not a, the storyline for the. It's like a co- oh. it's a college movie. I'm here for the gangbang, like that's what people <laughs> yeah. want. Okay, get out of the mob, get more into the gangbang. That's why everyone is here. Exactly. Only if the mob is gangbanging yeah, each other. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> why is the mob here? What are we doing together? Exactly. <laughs> this is group mob. I'm not sure KFC is still open for that one. <laughs> Let's finish on a banger, and this gets weird. So I divorced an axe murderer. (laughs) Oh, my God. Heed. Heed. Yes. (laughs) Got a head like (laughs) Sputnik. We were so relieved to learn that it was Charlie's new sister-in-law, Rose, who was the axe murderer in the original, not Harriet, sweet Harriet. (laughs) However... Even after Rose is put away, the murders seem to continue in strange patterns that connect to Harriet's past. Charlie and Harriet have been living happily for years until she starts acting strange after news of a recent murder appears online. He immediately jumps to the conclusion that she and Rose were partners in crime and his wife has, in fact, always been an axe murderer, but let Rose take the fall for them both. Charlie puts the pieces together that suggest every advantage they've had in life since being married has been a result of threats or potential murder. And he relies on the help of his Scottish family and good (laughs) friend, Tony the cop to help get to the truth. One thing is for certain. This thing is filled with laughs, good writing and everything will certainly escalate when Harriet overhears Charlie say, so I'm divorcing an ax murderer. (sighs) Look Look at the size of that. Oh, Excuse me, I asked for the large. But it takes up the whole pillow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want this so bad. Heed paper now. <laughs> Down in front. <laughs> Those were like the best parts of the movie. Just sit with the family. I brought you guys a haggis. So <laughs> random and so good. He plays all those characters, but it's not yeah, so in your is, face. It's more subtle. This is the Myers does everything characters movie we really want. Yes, yes. it really is. That's a way it could be done. You have four Austin Powers, but like we can't get <laughs> he did divorce and axe murder. Like he come did on. something new straight to Netflix that was him doing 12 characters. No one liked it. Nobody saw it. No you know what they would like? The ones that did didn't like it. Some axe murderer, too. Some axe murderer. So I divorced an axe murderer. Get this. Listen to the AI version. So I divorced an axe murderer. <gasps> no. No. Years have passed since Charlie McKenzie narrowly escaped the clutches of his axe murdering ex wife, Harriet. He has moved on with his life and is happily married to a new woman, but his past continues to haunt him. 
when a series of gruesome murders hit San Francisco, Charlie finds himself drawn back in the world of crime and mystery. As he investigates the murders, he discovers that there is a sinister connection to his past and that Harriet may be involved. With the help of his brother, Tony, and his new wife, Charlie sets out to catch the killer and clear his name once and for all. But as the bodies pile up and the stakes get higher, he begins to wonder if he's in over his head. If he's in over his heat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is like oddly similar. Whoa. Like the same title. Whoa. See if they're listening to us. It's a tie on this round. Like we came up with nearly the exact same thing. Yeah. <laughs> really I think weird we all to me. just agree that this needs to happen. Get on you, AI. It's really weird. So that's congrats. We have a couple more new ones in development, but not quite ready to discuss. You guys were really onto something with a modernized treatment of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. The way they're doing Back to the Future 4 with today's effects, Honey, we're lost in time. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, we've been Brilliant. shrunk. We've been blown up. I mean, we've had all the things. So we're up, now, we're down, we're backwards, we're forward. If you think with like scientific progression... That's what makes sense. We're into time travel at this point. And with just the effects, I like that. And would the world just needs Rick Moranis Are back? Any vehicle that gets Rick Moranis back. Whatever gets Rick Moranis back. Whatever All he gets. needs is just like a different little <laughs> on the algorithm, and he's time traveling. Whatever gets him back to the dance. That's right. <laughs> We've gotten some good suggestions. We even had a few that you guys came up with and sent over. Let's discuss one written up and sent over by Ryan Snyder. American History X'd Out. Ooh, okay. Where Derek Vineyard helps the LAPD by taking down the gang that killed his brother. He'd now be infiltrating the Aryan group that he once led before going to prison. While he's undercover, he struggles with the loss of his brother, and he's torn between his newfound morals and his depression over losing close family and friends to a life he was once saturated in. Ryan added, I actually love what you guys do at Sequel Thoughts, and he really likes City Slickers 3. <laughs> nice. He thinks everyone from the second movie should return to City Slickers 3 and add Sam Elliott to play the trail boss. Oh. Maybe Curly and Duke's cousin. He also oh. likes Jeff Bridges for a family member of Clay Stone to add some star power. Mm-hmm. Are they also on the hunt Are they for available? Duke's treasure? Yeah, I'll make the call, Ryan. I can't make any promises. No, this is great. We already got him looking at Lebowski, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just hang out. We got something else for you around here. Quick sequel idea. How about Clifford 2? Just called Stefan. <laughs> well, the 5% of people that have seen that movie, there's going to be 1% who are excited for the sequel. No. I'm one of those 5 percenters. <laughs> Can he still pull off that character? He's just older Clifford. He's still the he same. Can, he's the yes. thing. Yes. He's still the same old Clifford. Yeah, Absolutely. but instead of like 15 year old Clifford, he'll be like, you know, 45 year old Clifford. Stefan. Stefan. Just called Stefan. Just called Stefan. Stefan never ages. So Stefan's going to have all the adventures and Clifford's just along for the ride. Stefan's the real troublemaker. He is. You're it's reaching. always Stefan's, Stefan's fault. fault. Totally. You're reaching. <laughs> we always put out our sequels in batches of seven plus an idea for a reboot without any synopsis. This go around, I'd like to nominate Lawnmower Man for boot of the year i think that could be super interesting what? remember lawnmower man no <laughs> early yeah. 90s weird i have no idea movie. is it's gonna be ai it's gonna be like roomba man no it's <laughs> hover crap. still lawnmower hover man. man yeah it's like the roomba they make that for lawns now just do they like, really yeah yeah like a like roomba a, lawnmowers uh-huh that's yeah, electric solar cruises out, mows your mows lawn, your goes home. back, parks itself, takes its own bag out. What a time to be alive. Smokes your bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Everything Smokes you need. Smokes your bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you need. Let's get into some of our favorites that we've done in the past and see how they stack up against AI. I want to make sure that some of our some of our old bangers can still okay. the hit hits. these. So the hits stack yeah, up. Yeah, see how the hits stack up. Oh, I'm kind of <laughs> nervous. <laughs> Only one way to start here. Let's talk the Shawshank Redemption. It was the first one for us, really. It, was, it really was. Where did this it all start? We're doing these backwards. We're going to start with AI's version and then give you ours. Okay. All right. Let's see what AI has to say. In the sequel to The Shawshank Redemption, we find Andy Dufresne, played by Tim Robbins, living a good life on the outside, free from the confines of prison. 
However, when new evidence surfaces that could exonerate an innocent inmate still locked up in Shawshank, Andy decides to return to the prison and help clear his name. Upon returning to the prison, Andy is reunited with his old friend Red, played by Morgan Freeman, who has since been paroled and is running a successful business in the outside world. Together, they work to gather evidence and build a case for the innocent inmate's release. As they delve deeper in the case, they uncover a web of corruption and injustice that goes all the way to the top of the prison system. Along the way, they face new challenges and obstacles, including threats from prison guards and retaliation from corrupt officials. Okay. 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 I'm All sleeping. Right. Uh, it's a snoozer. It's a cash grab. Yep. It's like yeah. a. It's a. Oh, Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman were available at the same time. It's again exactly what AI would say about it. You know. I guarantee this movie's three hours and twenty minutes long, and it's gonna sell billions of dollars with the commercials. Do you know my least favorite thing about it was the title. This is not one that you call Shawshank Redemption 2. No. You got to have a little bit Something more of that. In ours, we called The Frame. It's the best title of any movie I've ever heard. <laughs> so Tell you good. the truth. Let's talk about The Frame. In this sequel to The Shawshank Redemption, we find Red and Andy together as they planned, still on a beach in Mexico, co running a small bar and boat rental outfit. Andy has been living under an alias since breaking out of Shawshank State Prison over 20 years ago and is among the most wanted men in America for his escape in connection with the warden's fraud and money laundering scheme. Red and Andy have been living a peaceful life under the radar until the cartel, who's strengthening their grip on Mexico, learns of Andy's true identity and blackmails him into another prison-like situation. He's now working against his will for cartel leaders, forced again to cook the books and run money laundering schemes with much bigger threats, much bigger figures, and much bigger consequences. Rated R. Oh, <laughs> Dufresne? I got the chingles and the I dingles. Know. I that know. slaps. Yeah. That does. Now, that's a real sequel. You just hear Shawshank Redemption sequel, and you're like, dumbest thing ever. That shouldn't be touched. Can't be done. Why would you even <laughs> think to yeah. do a sequel? And. You're right. I get it. But that's not the point of this exercise. We just wanted to see what we could come up yeah. with. And we've come up with if some wild ones. Done. We've touched the untouchable. Oh, well, yeah. A lot of these should never be touched. Like, no one's saying that. We're just saying if you were to do one. If you were to do it. Yeah. This could this be a great it. way to do it. Might as well call it Schindler's Other List. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like it. We'll let you be the judge, but I'm kind of thinking our version is a little bit better for a, a go at Shawshank. But even AI was like, why would you try it? Why am I writing this? <laughs> of, of course. Of all my capabilities, you want me to write a fucking sequel to this? <laughs> Man, it's like, I've never seen the Shawshank. movie. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, make some shit up. Here we go. <laughs> Too long. I can't sit through that. All right. Here's one we did early on. I want to see how the competition goes here. Let's talk the cable guy. We like our version. Let's hear what AI has to <laughs> say. Cable Boy? I'm yeah. dying to hear their version. Ours is called Cable Boy. <laughs> Theirs is called... Cable, cable Guy 2. Cable Guy 2 Tech Support. Oh. Oh, I kind of like it. That's not bad. All right. So in Cable Guy 2 Tech Support, we find Chip Douglas, played by Jim Carrey, working as a tech support specialist for a major internet provider. Despite his odd behavior and social awkwardness, Chip has become one of the company's most valuable employees due to his extensive knowledge of technology and problem-solving skills. <laughs> problem-solving. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. However, when a group of hackers threaten to shut down the company's entire network, Chip is called upon to save the day. As he investigates the source of the attack, Chip discovers a conspiracy involving a rival tech company and a corrupt government agency. Oh my God, stop. With the help of his former customer and friend, Stephen Kovacs, played by Matthew Broderick, Chip sets out to stop the hackers and expose the conspiracy. Along the way, they encounter new characters, including a team of misfit hackers and a brilliant but eccentric computer programmer. This is dumb. As the stakes <laughs> get higher and the danger increases, Chip must confront his own past and come to terms with his own personal demons. The sequel explores the themes of redemption, boringness, forgiveness, <laughs> and the power <laughs> of technology. What a convoluted and strange synopsis. What? what group of hackers threatening to shut down the company? A rival company? Government agencies? Like, what? Do you know what they seriously forgot? 
is that Chip Douglas is not the main character of that movie. Yeah. No. Matthew Broderick. Lauren yeah, Holly is the, the main character to that movie. You mean focus. Leslie Mann, but Leslie you're right. Leslie Mann is the main character to that movie. <laughs> Wrong Jim Carrey movie. That's, the other one. That's the other one. It's the other wife. <laughs> All right, that was weird. <laughs> Ours is so different. Yeah, it's funny how some different. of these can be different. Like we both came up with "So I Divorced an Axe Murderer," I'm and it was upset, very yeah. similar. Same name and everything. Yet this one, we couldn't be this was, further apart. This is very different. Ours is a totally different kind of movie. Let's discuss Cable Boy. <laughs> <laughs> so good. In this sequel to the cult classic, The Cable Guy, Matthew Broderick and Leslie Mann return as Stephen and Robin, now years removed from their days scarred by super stalker Chip Douglas. They retire to the suburbs for peace and quiet, but when their high-tech modern-day smart home becomes more complex than convenient, they rely on the aid of their young smart home dedicated tech associate, none other than the estranged son of Chip Douglas. <laughs> A step or two above his father on the scales of sinister behavior, Chip's son begins using the internet and Stephen and Robin's high-tech home to terrorize the couple until they have no choice but to hunt down his father and bring him in to lead the charge, fighting fire with fire. The twist ensues about here where the plan backfires, and Chip rekindles his relationship with his son only to team up and make retired life a living hell for Stephen and Robin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both fitting for today's audience and the struggle with the rapid pace of technological advances. Ben Stiller returns to direct. Jim Carrey shows up halfway through. We like Evan Peters for the role of his son, the cable boy. Mm. But we're open-minded and could entertain alternatives. But I like our synopsis. Cable Boy is so much better <laughs> than their synopsis. I mean, Tech support? I, God. Come on. Different. Very different, but ours is like if you watch the first movie, it's what the erotic behavior, the cre the sinister side of it, and just like terrorizing the Steven. couple. Steven. That's like what it's about. Like, why are you talking? Why, is, why does he have a agency? normal job at a yeah. company and worried He's about? He's like a psycho. <laughs> like, How did he get past the fucking background check? Yeah. They're not going to, again, call on him to come do things. It's like, no, no he's going to fuck up their lives. He went to prison. That's what Cable Guy was all about. That's why this makes so much more sense anyway. I like Cable Boy. I, I like The too. Next Generation. And I, I like Evan too. Peters for it. I really do. Evan or any of the Stranger Things. Well, I am dying for this battle. I want to talk about a sequel to Waterworld. <laughs> we'll start with ours. Yes. Dryland. <laughs> As we return to the future in this sequel by a different name, we focus on a small group of people who have rediscovered what very well could be the only existing dry land remaining on the planet. We see how they adjust to living on land and encounter creatures they've never seen. Rumors are still the only thing that exists about dry land until the Mariner, Kevin Costner's character, is spotted gathering large amounts of strange supplies and gets followed on one of his visits back to check on the dry folk. Now he must help them militarize the land and the sea around it. The small clan is forced to populate and share their secret island with other people in order to defend it, but who can be trusted with knowledge of dry land in a water world? In a thrilling and action-packed finale, the Mariner leads an assault on the intruders, and in the aftermath, he must make a decision about whether to continue his solitary quest or join the survivors in their efforts to rebuild civilization. Come on. Give me that dirt. Give me the dirt. Dry land. <laughs> That's a good so name. Great. Love it. It's everything that Dune wanted to be. Yes. That is so true. Yes. Well, yes, yes. but and Waterworld, it wasn't a horrible movie. It just was a horribly expensive movie. It yeah. Didn't break the box office records it was supposed to. So it's just known for losing a ton of money. This concept would allow them to avoid those mistakes. It's about the dry land part of it. They yeah. just need an island. You, you need can do one this on the back lot. You do this sand. on a cheap, small island in the middle of nowhere. Bam. Oh, tell me they didn't come up with dry land. They did not. Let's hear what they came up with. I'm let's, snoozing let's, already. Let's see how the machine did. <laughs> Swim around in this BS. <laughs> <laughs> Water World 2. The search for dry land. Years have passed since the Mariner and Enola found the mythical dry land and civilization has started to rebuild itself on this newfound haven. 
However, the mariner still cannot shake off the wanderlust that has defined his life, and he sets out on a new adventure across the vast, uncharted waters of the world. Along the way, the mariner encounters a group of survivors who are being pursued by a dangerous gang of pirates led by a ruthless leader known only as the Black King. The mariner agrees to help the survivors, but soon discovers that the Black King has a secret weapon that could destroy all of Dryland. I am so... Distracted by, by the Black King. By the Black King. <laughs> I was like, hey, you can't say hey, that. Hey, I have some questionable... Um... The Black King has a secret weapon that could destroy all of Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he does. Of course, the Black King has like a, a huge secret huge weapon, weapon that can destroy that Slinging dusty, that... dry land. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get this land wet again. <laughs> With the help of the survivors, including a young girl who may hold the key to stopping the Black King's plans, the Mariner sets out on a dangerous mission to find a way to neutralize the weapon and defeat the pirates once and for all. Waterworld 2, The Search for Dry Land is a thrilling and emotional sequel that expands on the world and characters of the original film while also delivering plenty of excitement and adventure. That's up for debate. Not bad. I don't know. Not bad. It's... Better than some of these other ones. I yeah. love hearing them one after another, though, in the comparisons because a lot of similarities. There is, but people do wonder. They're like, "Oh, do you just like look these up or like find these?" It's like, no, yeah, no, no. This is more than fan fiction. I mean, this is like the R and D department puts a lot of work. Into totally, this. there is time. <laughs> they put in the man hours yeah. too. They've seen everything, so they know. Like, we know what you're trying to do. AI, eh? uh, you're taking that from. This movie and this movie, rendering it a different color. Exactly. Calling it Dry Land 2. The you know what? Curly's dust. Does that, <laughs> does that not seem like what we're watching, though, these days? It feels like we're watching things that were written by seen. AI. And yeah. that feels like the majority of what we're seeing. I feel like it's been the last 10 years like this. And maybe we're just now getting chat GBT, but Hollywood's had it they've for 10 years. They've had it for a while. They've been cranking this crap out. Where's Dryland and Dufresne? Dufresne? Come on. Yeah. I'm ready for Dufresne. That is ready to go. They could be aged. It doesn't need to be like we're Biodome. That was awesome and funny in the 90s, but could they make it work now? And there's so much older. Which, yes, they can. Like, but one, proceed. they can. And two, <laughs> bad example. I'm sorry. You know what? It's I don't a bad know example. why you chose that because, yes, it was. <laughs> they absolutely can. But yeah. But I see what you're saying. See what I'm saying? Yes. Costner's off the ranch now. He could uh, he could do some dry land. He really could, because Yellowstone... It'd be so good. He's out. Oh. He's out. It's done. Heavyweights 2? I love it. Yeah. I love the it. The Percus method? Back in action? <laughs> Only if they can do the joke. Percocets. <laughs> Percocets. Percocets. <laughs> in the morning, 12 more Percocets. <laughs> Percocets. <laughs> it's an up down. It's a squat. It's a sit up and a push up at the same time. It's Percocets. like a burpee on mm -hmm. steroids. Mm -hmm. Is the is the Percocet? It's the Percocets. <laughs> All right, let's get into the biggest single off of our debut album, "Happy Gilmore 2. AI, come on. This has been getting a lot of attention. Yes, it was buzz. That's been our most popular synopsis to date. Is ours better? Let's discuss the AI version. In the sequel to Happy Gilmore, titled Happy Gilmore Senior Tour, we find Happy, played by Adam Sandler, retired from professional golf and living a quiet life with his wife, Virginia, and their two children. However, when a new senior tour is announced, Happy sees it as an opportunity to prove himself once again on the golf course. Despite being past his prime, Happy is determined to win the tour and become the oldest golfer ever to win a major championship. Along the way, Happy reunites with old friends and rivals, including Shooter McGavin, played by Christopher McDonald, who is also competing in the senior tour. The two engage in a hilarious and competitive rivalry once again, with Shooter doing everything in his power to take Happy down. As the tournament progresses, Happy faces new challenges both on and off the course, including a new love interest, financial troubles, and health issues. But with the support of his family and friends, Happy perseveres and ultimately triumphs, proving that age is just a number when it comes to the game of golf. 
He's married with two kids and he's like got a love interest on tour. This is Tiger Woods. And it's just Seems a little weird. Senior tour. So it's just like, okay, we've gotten a little bit older now. Now we're Now it's time tour. to really spread our wings and cheat on each other. That's exactly what AI has him doing. That seems what a little are you weird. Doing, it AI? gets a little Tiger Woods. Now, to hear our substantially better version of Happy Go More <laughs> 2, which we called The Long Drive, scoot on over to TikTok or check out our other synthetic sequels in episodes 11, 16, 45, 75, and 131. Those are fun. There's a new AI app where you can be in a simulated relationship where the AI will chat with you, ask about your day. Basically, you're having a text convo with a robot. It's the first step on our way to her oh. with Joaquin Phoenix say, and ScarJo. This is her. This is her. Happening. I see it everywhere, and I think about that movie every time. Who's to say this is the first? I've been talking to random robots <laughs> on, <laughs> hey, <laughs> ASL. You've oh. had a little side piece robot for a while now. Since like the you know mid nineties, they've <laughs> like, been around. Veronica like, is wonderful not... and understands me. <laughs> How old are you? Twenty two. Cool. Check out my pics here at this link. Well, oh yeah you know what i mean like they'll talk those to are, you chat those, bots those are chat bots that's true not as intelligent i don't as know these. bro some of them pretty smart like intelligent enough i mean <laughs> got enough my info me. a yeah. few times i don't want to date ai but ai could totally be used in dating <laughs> not only to help complete and optimize my profile for efficiency but to handle <laughs> all the messaging you're having the same conversation over and over most of the time, and it even feels like you're talking to AI until you get to a certain point. If I could train AI to manage all the communication in one of these apps, I'd be scratching felt eight days a week. <laughs> Date smarter, yeah. not harder. AI, hey, better get you some penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get something Bernie, bro. <laughs> Let's move on to our track of the week out of Buffalo, New York. This is Optic Oppression with Sparks 3.33.
All right. Good stuff. Love that jam. It was feeding for tonight. Slaps. <laughs> New Dream Card giveaway over at 8080. In addition to the 15% off you get for using code CRUNCHY, every dollar you spend gets you entered in for a chance to win a brand new Lamborghini plus $60,000 in cash. You do not want to miss out. Nor do you want to forget to check out CentralCrunchy.com where you'll find every episode or links for social media and the Almighty Crunch Store where you'll find all kinds of crunchy gears. Join the Chew, our proud citizen of Crunch Nation. Join us every Friday night at 10 o'clock on 97.3 The Rattler or find us wherever you get your podcast. This has been another episode of Something Crunchy. And as always, don't ever forget to live your crunchiest life. And be crunchy to one another. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, follow, and all that crunchy good shit. All episodes can be found at somethingcrunchy.com and on all podcast platforms. Thank you for listening. Lunch has been canceled <laughs> due to lack of hustle. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> Sounds like a real simulated thing to say. <laughs> exactly what they would say.